Right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Great to see you. I updated the slide. <laughs> I, can almost, I was considering for a second just spelling it out, and it seemed too long, so I, I gave up. Um, I could have done that too, but I think this is the official uh, acronym. Um, okay, so it's good to see you again. I sorry for you know not seeing you on Thursday, um, but it was for a good cause. So what I'd like to do this week, um, and I'm still looking for some input from you. There were um, a couple of comments on the Slack channel. Maybe you've seen them, maybe you won't. So I'll repeat them briefly. One is there was an ask to not do the project presentations on Thursday this week, but rather to do them later. So we have a little bit of flexibility. Um, we can do that, for example, Tuesday instead, next week, Tuesday. Um, so what I'd like to ask you is to tell me publicly or privately if you hate that idea and if you want me to keep it for, no, I'm serious. If you want to keep it for Thursday, if it's inconveniencing you in some particular way, um, uh, you should tell me that. Otherwise, I will. If I don't hear from you by the end of today, I will plan to do them on on Tuesday next week instead. Does that sound good? Uh, and you know, please tell me publicly or privately if you want me to keep them on Thursday. That's totally fine. Um, the other thing, we are uh, grading the lit review, and hopefully those will be out soon. Sorry, it took a little while longer. We're trying to give you as much feedback on the write-ups as possible to actually help you, you know, think about this for the next time. Uh, and it took us a little while longer than we were hoping. I, I'd like to, I, I'd like to get homework back within a week, but we were not able to do that this time. So I apologize for that. Um, third is, I uh, think it might be interesting and useful if we spend the day on Thursday actually doing qualitative analysis together uh, in class. Uh, but to make that happen, um, I would like to sort of set this up and curate this a little bit so that it's most successful and interesting. Um, and I would like to ask you, if possible, to share the transcripts from your interviews or some anonymized version of those with me today so that I can curate that set down to something that I think is, you know, fits together well and whatnot that we could all do uh, in class uh, on Thursday. And also this way you can read them in advance. I was gonna ask, um, do you want us to try to go through and correct them before we share them if they're automated or? Um, I mean, not if it's a lot of work. I, if they're even remotely legible, um, you know, I'm kind of fine getting a rough sense of what's there. I can ask you, so what I'm probably gonna do is, you know, we won't have time to go over all of them in class on Thursday. So I'd, I'd like to curate a smaller set that has similar protocols and whatnot that sort of makes sense to analyze together. Uh, and in order to do that, I will need to look at all of them. Um, so, you know, if I end up picking yours, which I'll tell you today, you know, I'll ask you maybe if you've needed to improve the transcription or whatnot, a little bit, otherwise we'll work with what we have. This is short notice. I don't wanna you know, put more work on you for, for no reason. So we have ours just in a Google doc, which has our protocol and then a uh, transcript from first interview, transcript from second. Um, first one was manually corrected by me, second was made by Whisper, and so is already high quality. Can awesome. we just share that with you directly or do we need to like anonymize it first? No, so I mean, I, I, if you'd rather keep it anonymous, you should anonymize it first. I won't do anything with it, but it will be shared with you know the class. So everybody will, you know, if I pick it for Thursday, everybody will have access to it in the form you give it to me, presumably. Yeah, but like, I just asked, like, are we required to, like for ethical or other reasons, or can we just share it with you directly? Well, you know, when you conducted the interview, you maybe haven't told your interviewee that a whole class of students is gonna dissect this. Well, I mean, we did tell them that the, the transcripts may be shared with the class. Okay, so yeah, as long as you're uh, not doing something that you don't have permission for, you know, I'm comfortable doing this. If you're comfortable that you have permission to do this, as far as your interviewees are concerned, I'm comfortable doing this. Okay. Uh, people's names because they said people's names. I feel like that's 
appropriate. Okay, that sounds fine. You can redact people's names or like a find replace. Uh, and I guess I won't publish the video on YouTube like I usually do, just to you know keep it uh, you know extra private. Yeah, that, that would that would violate what we told. Them. Yeah, so let's you know let's assume that I won't be publishing the video of our joint analysis uh, recitation, if you will, on Thursday. Okay. Uh, but but so I, I need to have these transcripts, uh, you know, today, right? So I could look at them tonight and pick some, uh, and have a clear plan for Thursday. So if you could please share the transcripts in you know whatever form you're comfortable with with me, uh, you know, send me an email with a link to something or whatever. However you want to do, I don't care. Just get it to me somehow so I can consider it. Make sense. Um, so we're going to we're going to do this instead of giving this as homework for you to do outside of class. We're going to try to do this together in class to hopefully learn from each other and how we're doing this and uh, discuss kind of what we're learning and, and all that. So we're going to set this up to be as interactive as possible. That's the plan for Thursday. Uh, and in this case, we will do project presentations on Tuesday. Again, conditioned on not uh, receiving any complaints that you want me to not do that. Okay. All right, so for today, Zoom folks, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay, um, so for today, what I would like to do is switch gears a little bit and talk about designing surveys. And actually there will be a lot of things uh, in here that are also relevant for uh, interviews and interview guides. So hopefully you'll see a lot of overlap with how to ask good survey questions and how to ask good interview questions. So that's the plan. I'm going to go over um, a big chunk of this book, which is awesome. Um, I have shared a digital version of this with you in the Google Drive folder, so you can read this uh, in more detail uh, on your own. The mixed whatever a surveys book, mixed mode surveys book. So I'm going to be covering these four chapters today, plus a bunch of other things, uh, and they're all in the shared folder, and you can all read them in more depth afterwards. Um, and I've already done that, so you have access to this. So why are we doing surveys? We're doing surveys to answer a, a range of kinds of questions, but often to answer prevalence questions, like how common is some particular phenomenon in some population, sort of, we do that. Um, we do surveys to answer relationship style questions between variables to you know, understand and test for relationships between variables. The surveys are a good mode for data collection for those kinds of questions. Um, and we can also do surveys to understand differences between soft populations or groups. Uh, we can survey them independently and compare results and whatnot. So these are just some examples of uh, common reasons why we might consider doing a survey. Um, and I guess, you know, often you've probably seen or heard of probability sample surveys, uh, the kinds of things that come up with election polling can be considered that, where, you know, you sample a bunch of people from some population and you ask them, I don't know, who they're likely to vote for, uh, and you try to generalize those predictions to the entire, you know, country or whatever, uh, based on, uh, on that. Um, so that's a probability sample survey because you're uh, only surveying a sample of the population and you're trying to generalize findings and results to the whole population. That's something that happens often. Um, so I'm, I wanna talk a little bit about this kind of survey. It doesn't just apply to election polling, it applies to all kinds of other scenarios. Um, and so what kinds of things to look out for when you're doing surveys like these? So the, the main goal, arguably, when you're doing something like this, is to minimize the error, the difference between what you're learning on the sample that ends up responding to your survey and what the true value of those variables actually is in the entire population that you didn't actually get a chance to uh, ask for the survey. All right, so for election polling, you're learning something about people's likely uh, voting preferences. 
right? And you're trying to minimize the error between you know what you learn on this typically small sample and what the entire country or whatever is going to end up voting come election time. That's often the main goal. So to do this, um, there's roughly four kinds of errors that you should keep an eye out for. Um, first of all, when it comes to the sampling frame, uh, like who do you consider inviting to your uh, survey? Who do you consider to be within the sampling frame for your survey? Um, and we're going to talk about errors there. The second is how do you draw a sample from that sampling frame of people that actually get invited to participate? The third is, you know, how are the people that actually end up responding to the survey, right? Because not everybody that you invite will end up responding. How are the people that end up responding different from the ones that did not respond, if at all? Because it's important to understand those differences because, you know, ultimately, remember, the goal is to generalize to the entire population. So you want to know what your blind spots are. Um, and finally, uh, questions around how valid and reliable are the things you asked and the measures you derive uh, through the survey the instrument and the questionnaire. And so we're going to talk about these four kinds of uh, errors for a little bit. Let me give an example of coverage error. Um, classical example is uh, random digit landline telephone surveys where uh, you randomly generate phone numbers and you call them and you ask those people you know questions and this way you're hoping to approximate the you know population at large um, and the coverage error here is because the sample of people with landlines as it turns out uh, is quite different from the population at large it's usually or at least historically Hardly anybody has landline, landlines these days, but the principle holds. Historically, it was the wealthiest of people that had landlines. You know, if you were to use this method to compose your sampling frame, uh, people with landlines, you would have a huge blind spot because uh, we know from all kinds of other sources that the people without landlines in their homes tend to be different in a number of important ways. And, you know, therefore what you're learning from this sample of people with land lines can be quite different from um, what the population at large would reveal. Uh, the same for, you know, people, uh, you know, let's say you're administering an internet survey and uh, you know, where you do that among CMU students as a proxy for the US population at large is a questionable decision because, you know, probably CMU students are going to be quite a bit more, you know, tech savvy and whatnot uh, than the you know, average person in the US population at large. Right, so these are examples of coverage errors when putting together a sampling frame. Uh, sampling errors are, have to do with how you draw your sample. A common way of drawing a sample is what? Randomly, very good. So you randomly choose people from the population to uh, be part of your sampling frame. Um, you've probably noticed or you've thought about this. It's surprising maybe, it was to me, how few people you would need to survey to obtain a decent estimates, meaning with acceptable levels of precision of whatever variables you're measuring. Let me give you an example. So let's say, uh, you know, the CMU population of students, about 14,000 students. Um, and let's say you're looking for a high quality, high confidence sample. Uh, you've seen numbers like these before, 95% confidence, 2% uh, margin of error. I'm gonna come back to this in a minute. You, maybe you will be surprised to learn that you need about 2000 students to achieve that level of uh, statistical uh, confidence in your sample. But that sounds quite large, right? Like you have 2000 students out of 
14,000 students. It's quite a lot of students that you have to survey, right? So, you know, it's, it's still a lot of work. Uh, the more surprising bit uh, comes next. If you consider the whole US population, which is, you know, 300 and some 30 million people, you might be surprised to learn that you need just a couple, just a few hundred people more relative to the CMU population to get a random sample with uh, similar, conf uh, similar confidence. So, you know, 95% plus or minus two random sample of the entire US population would only require some 2384 people. Isn't that weird? Statistics, right? So you go from 14,000 CMU students to 330 million Americans. And to be confident in that generalization, all you need to do is ask some 300 people more relative to your CMU sample. Awesome. Okay. I was mind blown when I learned this. Like, wait, what? That can't be. Anyway, it is. Um, you can double check me. There's a cool, you can find this anywhere online. Uh, this is the one I use most frequently, sample size calculators. Just type that into Google and the first hit will be something you can directly use in your browser. Uh, this is the one I have to uh, use most often. Okay, so now a quick aside here, just to remind you. So uh, just so we know, we're talking about the same thing. So when we talk about confidence intervals or also known as margin of error versus confidence levels. So the, conf the margin of error is the plus or minus figure that is usually reported with survey estimates. Right? All of the election polling, if you ever looked at those, they are accompanied by some plus or minus figure. Right? that tell you, you know, plus or minus 4% or whatever. Uh, this candidate is likely to get these many votes plus or minus 4% or something. So that's the margin of error. Um, obviously lower is better. So uh, this tells you uh, how sure you can be that among the entire relevant population, uh, you know, your estimate, uh, plus or minus that number would have answered you know, X to this particular question. I said, that's how sure you can be that your answer generalizes to the whole population. Um, and then the confidence level, it, it, so it defines that sureness. So this tells you how often that true percentage at the population level uh, would lie within the confidence interval should you draw a different random sample? Okay, so you know, you've drawn a random sample and you found out that the percentage of people responding X is 43%, right? If you were to draw that random sample again and again and again and again, you would obviously end up with, you know, different people in your random sample, okay? Um, and the confidence level tells you how sure, how often the true percentage of people that would answer X to your question lies within that confidence interval you defined previously. Make sense? So higher is better here. You want this to, you know, you, you want this confidence level to be as high as possible. You want the margin of error to be as low as possible. Right? And you often play with these numbers to come up with some uh, reasonable sample size for your study. You often also see that papers explicitly mention what this is and how they arrived at it and why they derived why did they end up surveying you know 284 people well it's because of something like this so a better paper uh, will motivate and describe how they arrived at the that size of their sample uh, okay any any questions on this all right so that was, we talked about coverage. We talked about sampling. We very briefly talked about non-response. So just to remind you, this is how different the people that end up responding to your survey are from the people in the sample you invited, right? Because remember, again, your goal is to make an 
claims about everyone, not just the people that ended up responding. Um, so, you know, one way to achieve lower non-response error is to increase the response rates, right? That seems obvious. Right, so if, you, if, you, if everybody you invite to your survey ends up responding and completing the survey, then you know, that should reduce the non-response error because there aren't people that haven't responded that could potentially be different from the ones who responded, right? And then the lower your response rate, the less confident you can be, right? So you have to think about this you know, carefully. What are some reasons why the people who haven't responded, haven't responded, you know, other than they were lazy or something, um, you know, how might they be different and how might that affect your estimates and the claims you're making based on the sample of people that did end up responding? Okay, that makes sense? So on this, uh, an aside, who writes product reviews on Amazon? Same principle. Right? It's the, well, except for the people that get paid or send freebies to write reviews. Um, like when would you, you know, consider writing a review? Like if you're really angry about it or something, yeah. Oh, I think so, right? It's it's probably more uh, often the extreme. Right? If you really love it, you're so uh, enamored with it and excited, you know, you're more likely to go the extra mile and write a review. If you really hated it, if you had a terrible experience, then yeah, you're angry and you want to complain. So you're going to go write a, a, a terrible review. Uh, but that's probably, you know, what you see in product reviews online. It's probably not at all representative of the population at large, because most people will probably not bother writing a review in the first place, and maybe they just had an okay experience. Who knows? Or you know, you know mildly okay or mildly annoying, but not enough to uh, go the extra mile and actually write about it. Okay. Um, similar with FCEs, by the way, also uh, course evaluations. Right? If you're you know, really hated the course, you're more likely to respond to the email asking you to fill out the survey at the end. Um, so, you know, that's an example of uh, non response error. Okay, and finally, we have measurement error. So, this is about, you know, how valid are the questions you're asking and how valid are the measurements you're, you're taking using the survey instrument. And we're going to talk a lot more about that today. Uh, right, so do the questions actually measure the idea or a concept of interest? Okay, yeah, so here. So, let's say Let's say you're asking people about their household income for the previous year as a measure, as a proxy, as a measure for their uh, household wealth. Uh, and that's arguably a bad measure of wealth because people that are retired uh, will probably you know, have much lower uh, yearly income because they've just retired. They don't get you know, their paychecks anymore, uh, but they'll probably still have you know, all of their wealth. So this is an example of how the thing you think you're measuring is not the thing you're actually measuring because the, you know, your proxy measure was a bad proxy for the thing you actually were looking uh, to measure. Okay, so let me show you an example. Um, we talked a lot about uh, increasing responsiveness to surveys. Has anybody done surveys for like research purposes? Couple of people, how, yeah. So, how? What was the response rate? Tell me a bit about the context. In um, any order. Yeah. So, mine was for a study of open source developers. We, I basically had a stratified sample that, and so we had maybe nine thousand people that we ended up reaching out to. Um, four hundred sixty-five responded, which ended up being a response rate of four or five percent, which is also four or five percent. Four or five percent among open source developers. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, Courtney. Uh, yeah. I think um, in the past I've sent a survey also to open source people or people who had like disengaged from open source, and I think we got about like a twenty percent response rate. And then at an internship, I sent one to like 
developers at a company and I think it was like slightly higher like maybe 26 percent interesting Elijah thanks Courtney um it was kind of a different survey so like we conducted a survey that was more like posted on social media and sent out an advertisement so we don't actually know how many people uh -huh, uh -huh. saw it but we got under 100 people and it was kind of a niche looking particularly about um, certain people's privacy needs so uh, it's kind of a particular we have no idea <laughs> okay yep thanks okay um, I, it's, it's like similar to, I mean, it's like open source and it's just kind of got emails and it's just like repositories of the author of it. Um, I sent out maybe 2,000 and I got back 10%. But okay. the thing is, only maybe 7% of that were interested in doing the survey. There was like 3% where it's like hate mail. Yeah, like some of them were it was mad at me for like, how did you get this email? Stop spamming. Some of it was like, who are you? Like, what does this even mean? So it's like lower than interesting. Yeah, very good. Anyone else has has anyone else had experience with surveys? Okay, so let me tell you a story of an amazing survey that people did at Washington State University uh, some years ago. Um, they ended up surveying six hundred PhD students there uh, about their dissertation work and graduate training. And this is literally a textbook example of a survey. It is literally that because I took it out of the textbook that I mentioned <laughs> for the class today. Um, okay, so here's a uh, uh, so timeline visualization of the various things they have done. On the x axis, I see I have to move my cursor to over here and then I could do something. So on the x axis, you see the timeline, the dates. On the y-axis, you see the response rate, cumulative response rate by that particular date. So you know it can only it can only go up over time. It cannot go down. Okay. So here's what they did. They started with um, a letter and the USPS in the mail, the snail mail, a letter with a URL printed on a piece of paper for people to uh, participate in the survey, you know, invite, inviting them to copy or whatever, type in the URL in the browser and go and fill out the survey. And they also included uh, two $1 bills, or $2 in the envelope together with that survey invitation. So that was the first thing that uh, got them about 8% or so uh, responses. Then they sent out an email the next day, the next few days. They sent out an email reminding people, you know, hey, we sent you a letter uh, to invite you to participate in the survey. You know, here is the link again, this time in an email. You can now just click on it. You don't have to like type it in to make it easier for you to respond. You know, would you mind doing that? I'll show you the actual uh, text of these in a second. Then, uh, I don't know, a few days later still, another email reminder saying, you know, hey, we've sent you now this letter and this other email about this survey, you know, could you please, could you please do that? It's really important, you know, something like this. Um, so this, wait, it took about, so this is end of March to uh, mid-April. It took about two weeks. They waited about two weeks and this got them already quite a bit of the data, 60 some percent of the people responded already by that. Okay, so not bad at all. But guess what? They did not stop there. So, so what they did next is they printed out the survey instrument, the questionnaire, they printed it out and they mailed it to people again in another letter, you know, asking them to fill it out on paper, you know, like, hey, you know, Maybe you didn't like to do this on the digitally on the computer. You know, here's a paper version. Could you please fill this out? Uh, and here we're enclosing a, a prepaid envelope to mail this back to us. So you know, just fill it out on paper and send it back to us. And uh, and finally, another email you know, after that, is reminding them of all of this. Okay, you know, but 
okay? End result, 77% of the population they uh, sampled responded to this questionnaire. Yep. So I, like ethically, um, I feel like there's a certain point where you're just like sending people a lot of things to like try to get their attention. I mean, at what point is it like, clearly this person, like, seeing an email reminder that's one thing but like repeatedly sending them things in the mail and stuff like that it seems i'm not i'm not saying they did it wrong in this case what i'm asking i'm just presenting the question of like at what point do you take it as an implicit like denial of like i don't want to do this survey um, so basically when does it become harassment is what you're yeah. asking um i don't know that i'm qualified to answer this i, I think the answer is now, this is something between you and your institutional review board. Uh, this protocol, you know, as described here, is you know something they had uh, agreed on with their institutional review board before doing any of this. Uh, and so those are people that are better qualified to to assess this, right? Than than I. Uh, but I, you know, I I agree. It's a little pushy, right? Uh, but it was also effective. It got them unusually, unreasonably high response rates, like close to 80%. Like that just never happens. Uh, does this affect the quality of the response? Like, do you get people who try to troll? And do you get duplicate response? Because they said, I also, they also said that service. Yeah, that's a great question. Like, do people try to game this or whatever, a troll back? Um, I, I don't know. Um, Try looking at the actual book and see if they say more about it or the original survey, which is described in this paper. Um, so I, I don't know is the short answer. I They do account for duplicate answers, I'm pretty sure. I remember reading that, that seems uh, obvious because they have these uh, hashed uh, hash codes that they you know, ask people to, uh, to paste in or that are part of the URLs. So they you know, track uniqueness that way. Um, I don't know about trolling, uh, kind of people submitting garbage responses back. Um, here are the things, the yeah, examples of the actual communication. So this is the original letter that went out. Um, so I want to draw your attention to a few things in kind of how this is phrased. Like one is you can see uh, official letterhead. You can see, you know, uh, what you know looks professional uh signed by an actual person you know with their affiliation and whatnot um you can see an introduction and a motivation for who the researchers are and why they're doing what they're doing i'm writing to ask for your help with an important survey we're conducting of doctoral students i understand that you've successfully completed your proposal and are now at the stage of needing to complete the dissertation. Uh, my colleague and I have been working with the National Science Foundation to better understand the needs of uh, doctoral students, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, greatly appreciate if you could answer a few questions. Simply go to this website uh, and type in this access code. Uh, should take about 10 minutes to complete the questionnaire. It's confidential. Answers will not be linked, et cetera. Participation is voluntary. Here's who you can contact should you have questions and concerns. So lots of things about what? Like what, what does this tell you? And kind of how this is phrased and formatted and all that. <laughs> it looks like they went through a lot of trouble, right? To do this. It wasn't a you know, rushed thing that, uh, I don't know, they pulled together and uh, on their commute to work that morning. It's something they put a lot of thought into uh, uh, formulating. Uh, here's the email reminder, very you know, similar. Earlier this week, we sent you a letter asking for your help with an important survey, blah, 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 blah. I'm following up with this email to provide you with an electronic link to a survey website. I hope this makes it easier for you to respond. It should only take a few minutes, blah, 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 blah. Results will help us. Participation is voluntary, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so trust is what I'm getting at here. Like this looks... You know, legitimate is one thing that I want you to take away from this. But it looks like they, you know, the researchers put a lot of thought and showed a lot of respect for the you know, time of their respondents. 
um, and people reciprocate it by responding at higher rates than one might have otherwise expected. Um, this is a really cool, uh, very subtle thing that was going on here. And I want to insist on this for a second because it's awesome. Um, I mentioned this at the beginning. There were $2, $2 notes, $2 that were given out to people uh, in those uh, initial letters with the initial survey invitation. So like, why do you think that had any effect or like, what do you, what do you think happened with that? that if you send people money ahead of time they they feel um obligated to complete the task and so other things they use this like you might get like a penny or a, a dime or something in the mail with a thing like this dime could feed a child and it's like why did you send the dime to me um but it's a similar i think motivation uh -huh. strategy yep yeah part of it is also the statistical Cash is also a really big thing for you. Like it's a, like I think studies have that much that people manage your money, or like there's a people tend to manage your money when they have people cash they can see uh -huh. how much they have in front. And so that that uh-huh. Yeah, it's a tangible cash in hand. Okay. Yeah, and so this is actually well documented. So let me give an example of this one study that I thought was fascinating. So this was a study uh judging by the currency maybe done in Russia. Uh rubles so three conditions the control group was offered no incentive to participate in the questionnaire and they had two treatment groups one was they paid people 50 rubles the equivalent of a dollar 65 at the time um, up front similar to this uh, example i gave you here with the survey requests, they, they gave people 50 rubles, just like these people gave everybody $2 up front, you know, and people could still choose not to respond. Okay? The third group is they offered a more sizable chunk of money to people that responded to the survey, but nothing up front. So you know you're not getting two dollars up front, but you're promised a greater reward if you actually return a completed questionnaire. Right? Often we I don't know raffle out say I don't know hundred dollar Amazon gift cards or stuff like that for research surveys. A similar principle. You don't give everybody hundred dollars because that would be expensive and you can't afford that as a researcher. But maybe you have the ability to give out you know one or a few of these prizes at the end. To somebody you draw, you know, as, as part of a raffle. Okay, so that's the same principle here. So what happened is super fascinating. So in the no incentive group, about 10% of people responded. The people that were paid a tiny amount of money up front, 37% responded. The people that were not paid anything up front, but were promised a greater reward upon completion responded at a lower rate than the people who were offered a small amount of money up front. Um, and uh, apparently the most effective was to actually combine this. So to give people something small up front as well as promise them a greater reward, reward upon completion. Um, and it's really this, the, the principle is referred to as a social reward. That's the mechanism. Like if I do something for you, I give you two dollars unsolicited without you having done anything for me in exchange. This creates this implicit obligation. You feel obliged to reciprocate in some way. That's just as it turns out, human nature. Right? So it's not so much the amount as it is the gesture, the fact that I did something for you that you perceive as not um, having earned. Right, not deserving, but you didn't do anything for those $2. You got it for free somehow. 
you feel like you owe me in some sense, right? So you're, as it turns out, more likely to, you know, do this thing that I ask, uh, ask of you. Right? Even if there's a risk, you know, that you do nothing and just take the money. That's it. That's the story. I thought it was, I thought it was fascinating that this works. So now, uh, right. So that's the mechanism. Uh, so okay. One other thing: money is not the only way you could do this. Although money is a great way you could do this, can you think of other ways you could use the same uh, mechanism to get people more excited to participate? in your survey. Some some digital equivalent of this or some something else. Yeah, James. Um, you can say like fewer You should always do that, but that's not social exchange. It's not something. It's not something you give them up front that that sort of triggers this mechanism, this response. I'm asking specifically. You know, what are some other examples, you know, other than money up front, other examples that would trigger the same mechanism? Uh, yes, Sophia. Also, yes, but does not trigger social exchange. You don't feel like you owe me. You just feel like it's easier to respond, but you don't feel like you owe me a response. Oh, how Yes. <laughs> how did guilt trip? Let's see, other examples of guilt tripping. Yes. I was, you go first. Okay, I was gonna say, and I haven't fully thought about this, but maybe one that's comments like providing a tool or service or something and then as a by the way if you have thoughts on this or something like that uh, we would appreciate your response i think like iot inspector which is a similar thing has like they provide a tool which you can use to look at iot devices and you have the option to provide service data as well yep yeah so this is a great uh alternative to money i'll show you another example of this in a second did you have something in um, it might not fit the behavior, but what I found that really worked is like this work, you know, the internal like, human like, handling addiction is that I think something that might, like one in a hundred chance you might really get addicted to the survey. I found that to be very successful uh -huh. instead of just being everyone the same. So by the way, on, on gamification, you know, another way, another way to do this uh, and create social pressure is to tell them that you know their colleagues and friends have already responded. <laughs> oh no, that's not allowed. That's against no, the IRB. Like what they used to do like for army recruits. It's like if you are already doing this, you don't join Uncle Sam. Like you are <laughs> Yeah. You can't say it's mandatory. Well, isn't that what they do with the census? Um, well, I mean, for IRB, you can't say that it's like contingent on their employment or anything else. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You just like, report it with all cops. It's like the, the <laughs> title of your email. Like, important. Yes, I guess the government doesn't have an IRB <laughs> to do census. Um, I just want to extend another, I think this is more for the medicine, but I know like when you look at like survey things, like, like for instance, I have a friend who's running a study on some sort of professional group, like physicians or something, and she was saying that like, it's sort of like those physicians also tend to run studies, and so there's like this sort of community incentive to like generally answer surveys because you know that the people that you're asking them might also Oh, the people that you're asking also probably were surveyed there that you. Uh huh. Yeah. So we're super, yeah, we're super getting in that way. Yep. I agree. Yep. yep. Food, especially if your population is like graduate students. <laughs> yeah. If Bobo was here, Hongo, he would say, you know, just double my stipend, my PhD stipend. <laughs> that would make it very attractive to respond to your survey. Um, right. Okay. So let me give you an example of something that we have done. Well, how am I going to do that? 
By the way, I did not have eat unique for last day. Wait, so what? I did. I ended up having roots, whatever uh, roots, vegetable garden. So, am I ranting it or does that count? I don't know. I hardly believe because I saw you carrying a eat unique box earlier today at lunchtime. I, I know. So I was able to um, save that and source a different lunch. That was Ruth's vegetable kitchen because I was worried, you know, about, <laughs> about what might happen if I actually end up eating that for lunch. Um, is this it? Do we have the invitation? No. No. Ah, yes. Okay, very good. So here's an example. Um, along the same lines of the tools, you know, here's a cool tool. And by the way, if you have any, if you don't mind participating in the survey, we would appreciate it. Let me make this bigger. So this is part of a project. Yeah, so this is part of a research project that I was involved in some years ago, um, and this is part of the invitation email uh, that was sent out to people uh, inviting them to participate in the uh, survey, and the thing, the, the equivalent, we didn't send money here, also at the time I didn't know about this cool trick, um, but the equivalent of that was to give people something up front with the invitation email, give people some information in this case, or a cool visualization arguably, something that they did not already have or did not have access to otherwise. We gave them something, you know, we computed these sort of dashboard uh, visualizations of their activity across different projects. Uh, this mimics, if you're familiar with the GitHub user interface, this mimics the uh, whatever heat maps of commits per day that you get by default on the GitHub platform, except the metric is different. So we sort of kept the style of the visualization, but plotted a different metric. The one that we were particularly studying in this project was about how people work on multiple projects in parallel and switch between them. Uh, and so we created these custom visualizations and sent them out to you know everybody uh, as part of this uh, you know, invitation email. And this was a way to you know, give them something without them having yet to give us anything in return. Okay. Yeah, well, that too. <laughs> okay, so now I can go back to this. So let's see, we talked about right. So this is a sort of list of things that you should consider and arguably uh, you know use ideally all of them if you can. Things that are uh, that can get uh, people to be more likely to respond, to feel like they uh, will be better off responding than than not. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, the one one thing that I find personally annoying: the scarcity principle. You've maybe seen this. If you spend any time on Twitter at all, you've probably seen all of these ads for. Uh, whatever user feedback surveys that Twitter itself the platform is running. Uh, and next time you see one, stop and actually read the message and note how it's an example of the scarcity, scarcity principle uh, here, where they're making it sound like you are somehow very lucky to be in the position to provide them with free feedback. And you know, not everybody has that chance. Only very few people, you know, have the chance to give feedback back to the platform and you know improve the platform in some way through that feedback. Right. So you you know you are selected and you should consider yourself lucky to be in that position to provide this feedback, uh, and you know therefore you should respond. But that's an example of creating scarcity. 
only some people get asked, and you, you tell them that explicitly, like you know, you're you're part of a select few, you know, they're all very special, you know, you're one of very few special people that gets to fill out our survey. You know, you know, could you please do it? <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. I, I... Yes. <laughs> we were actually the only people who. <laughs> oh, wait. We're, we're being recorded. We can't, you know, we, we can't harbor these thoughts in, in, you know, on the internet. We'll be on YouTube forever. <laughs> okay. And I did not have eaten it for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh all right so yeah we talked about so maybe this is a better analogy the trick is to so this shows you this balance on one hand decreasing the costs of people participating in the survey you know by making the survey short and easy to answer and all those and not making people uncomfortable etc 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 making it interesting you know all the ways in which you're decreasing the cost of people participating various modes that they can respond you know in the example we had before people could respond on paper could respond digitally you know whatever it was most convenient to them like these are ways to decrease the cost of people responding right so you know obviously do all of those that you can plus ways to increase the benefit of people responding like tell them exactly how the results will be used argue in what ways they can benefit from those, if at all, even if indirectly, uh, you know, et cetera, uh, incentives for them to participate and so on, like ways to increase the benefit. Uh, and the foundation of all of this is establishing trust that this is a legitimate research project, um, you know, not some, I don't know, uh, corporate interest to do something nefarious or whatever else. Uh, so that's sort of the key idea. And you can read more about these different ways to achieve this okay so let's talk about questions now we talked about kind of set up a lot but we haven't talked about questions much let's talk about questions um so one super important well-known uh effect to be mindful of the bias to be mindful of the so-called social desirability bias does anybody know what this means what does yes, Luke? Right, so that's exactly the idea. Uh, when you ask people things that are potentially sensitive or uncomfortable or whatever, um, they might not be entirely truthful. We talked a little bit about this with interviews also. It's especially the case with interviews because you're asking them face to face and you know they can't really tell you to your face, you know, what really happened because you know, it'll be really embarrassing. So they have to make something else up. So it's the same idea here. Uh, people, you know, will want to make a good impression. Um, and all right, so here's a cool example. How often do you drive a car after drinking alcoholic beverages? Frequently, occasionally, seldom, never, or don't know. So if, uh, you know, when an actual person called people up and asked them this question so over the phone, 63% said, never, I never do this. When they were given a paper uh, survey that they could fill out in the privacy of their own home and mail back, could be similar with an internet-based survey, 52% responded never. Right, so, you know, in this case, the researchers had no reason to believe that these were different populations. So really, the effect here is claims to be the social desirability bias. Like, when you ask them directly over the phone, people won't be as likely to admit that they've done this because it paints them in a negative light, because it's you know, a socially undesirable thing to do, and people are less likely to admit to having done this, okay? When they are more confident that they're doing this in privacy, they're more honest. Okay. Um, another similar example, how would you describe your current health, excellent, good, fair, or poor? Uh, fewer people say excellent, in self-administered surveys compared to interviews. So more people will say excellence in an interview. 
face to face than they would in private. Uh, and you know, for example, think of this uh, conventional uh, American greeting of "How are you?" Whenever you ask this, uh, if anybody ever responds, you know, people are unlikely to ever tell you that they're having a terrible, miserable day and their life sucks. Uh, it's much more likely that they will say, you know, fine, I'm okay, how are you, whatever, like, you know, something positive, right? So it's the same, same principle here. And, you know, lots more examples of this. Um, oh, yeah, here's yet another one. 20% of web survey respondents denied having ever received a D or an mm -hmm. F in college when, in, <laughs> fact, in fact, they had received one of these grades. Because you know they don't want to remember that, or they don't want to admit it. Wait, how did they know this? How do researchers know this? <laughs> that is a question for you to answer as homework by referring to the actual study. <laughs> I assume they had a way of tracking respondents. Because how else? Okay. Yeah, you have another one. I'm on a roll. See, and it wasn't each unique. <laughs> um, both men and women were more likely to report engaging in extramarital sex when interviewed by a same sex interviewer than when interviewed by an opposite sex interviewer. Uh, and I think the list can go on and on. And on. <laughs> okay, so social desirability. This is something that is well documented. I picked a few flavorful examples, but there's lots more. Um, and you know, it's something to expect, even on technical questions, et cetera. You know, if you ask people uh, questions about their you know, expertise or knowledge of something and you know, things like this, all of these questions where uh, it's, it's socially desirable for them to paint a, a better, rosier picture of the situation than the reality, you can expect these kind of biases. Another super common one is acquiescence. Does anybody know what this is? Does anybody know what the term means or what the device is? Aiden? Yeah, it's like, um, like rapport. Close, yeah. You're, I think you're going in a good direction. Anybody here, Cindy? I think a general term for acquiescence. Or well, this feeling that I get is like you almost feel like there's pressure on you and you just kind of you let go up or like you let into that. I think this refers to something slightly different. So let me just tell you uh, this is a tendency to agree with people rather than disagree. As it turns out, we are uh, more, more likely to agree with each other because. Because you know it's it's perceived as uh, reducing the risk of conflicts and whatnot, and you know nobody, well, few people want to actively get into fights with others. Like most people prefer to just get along. Um, so it's the same with surveys and interviews. Uh, people have a tendency to agree with you rather than disagree with you because. For one, if they disagree with you, then they have to explain, you know, all of the ways in which you're wrong, and that would just take longer, right? So, and you know, they have other things to do with their day, so they're much rather you know, just get it over with, right? And you know, uh, agree with you. So, lots of examples uh, here. 60% uh, of people agreed that individuals are more likely to blame the social conditions for crime and lawlessness in the country. Um, and about as many people agreed uh, to the exact reverse <laughs> when asked, you know, social conditions are more to blame than individuals for crime and lawlessness, right? So, you know, they both, they can't both be true at the same time, right? Because that would, you know, account for more than 100%. So, you know, clearly, you know, they can't, these both can't be true at the same time. So what you're seeing here is an example of how you know, people just sort of went along with the statement as formulated uh, because they were just you know, agreeable. Okay. So, right, so this goes into uh, 
other subtle things that might trigger acquiescence bias. Um, there's a whole bunch of these as a whole model on how primacy and recency are two of these biases uh, and how, um, you know, how, how they play out. So let me see if I have, right. So here, I have some examples of this. So, um, let's see, right. So the question was, which food is more typically German? And then people were given two, well, there were two groups of people. One group was offered potatoes and rice as options, as answer options. The other group was offered rice and potatoes as options. The only difference being the order in which the two are provided. And okay. very different responses here because of how one acted as an anchor for the other, because people read top down or left to right typically. Um, so you know, when you ask potatoes and rice, so potatoes, which is the uh, more typically German food is the one you see first, there's no anchoring. When you ask rice and potatoes, you anchor potatoes in rice and the contrast is starker between potatoes and rice. So more people will say potatoes when you give them some anchor that is obviously, you know, very not typically German compared to the other way around. I thought they're both less than 50%. Interestingly, yeah, I thought I this doesn't make sense to me either. <laughs> I thought it would be, you know, 90%. So I don't know what's up with rice in Germany. I, don't, I guess we'll have to ask, uh, I don't know, Toby or Christian or someone to explain this to me. So on all of these, I'm assuming that the groups are indistinguishable on these, you know, confounds. Both here and, and previously, I'm assuming like, that. Yeah, of course. So, <laughs> right. So that, that's fair. I, I'm assuming, though, that between conditions, as similar people, right? So, you know, what are your, if you're in Boston, you're in Boston in both conditions. That makes sense. Right, so you know here as well. Right? So I'm, I'm assuming all of these things. I don't actually have the entire paper in front of me right now. But, you know, for the sake of arguing, let's assume that all of that is true, and focus only on the main effect, which is the thing that I'm trying to illustrate. Uh, assuming everything else, you know, checks out. I, I agree. There's lots of other reasons why this can happen, but I'm assuming that's not the case at all here. I'm assuming they've done all of that carefully. Um, okay, so this is called anchoring. That's one of these effects. Um, okay, yeah. All right, anything on anchoring or how do we avoid this? Do you like randomly shuffle your good answers? Yes. Yes, you can. You can randomly shuffle the survey answer options so that well the software that's running the survey uh, does that for you automatically so you know every time somebody new takes the survey they get the answer options presented in a different random order that's the trick yeah uh, but you know you should remember to do that or account for that i think i have a few more examples of this uh in a little bit okay so uh, quickly some various types of survey questions. Um, you can ask open-ended questions, like what is the most important problem facing Nebraska today? And then there's a big uh, empty uh, text block or something that people can type whatever into. You can ask uh, something that requires a number. You know, how many years have you lived in Nebraska? Please report on the whole numbers. So you know, people will say you know, 20 years or whatever lived in uh, Nebraska. You can ask closed-ended ordinal questions, like how satisfied are you with living in Nebraska? 
uh, ranging from completely satisfied to completely dissatisfied uh, or not at all satisfied in this case. By the way, here's a funny one. <laughs> Has anybody seen this? It was on the internet, uh, made around a few days ago, very fresh. What stands out to you? Somebody that hasn't seen this, that doesn't know the, uh, the trick yet. What stands out to you? <laughs> so this is a distribution of uh, body height reported by US men. Uh, it's a huge sample. What, what stands out to you? People that are really close to five foot 11 or six foot, and you have a tendency to round up. That's the idea, right? So you would expect, you know, you would expect a very normal bell shaped curve here. But what you see very clearly is that there's way more five foot 11 people than, sorry, way, way more six foot people than you would expect, right? The spike should not be there and way fewer five foot 11 people than you'd expect. Five, five, ten and a half, I think is the answer. Right. This suggests that the five eleven people are often likely to just round up. Um, so this, you know, when you ask, it, it reminded me of this, when you ask people, how many years have you uh, lived in Nebraska? Uh, please report only whole numbers. If you lived in Nebraska for 20 months, please round to two years. Like here, you know, here they're not even expecting an accurate count, but you know, even when you're asking for an accurate count, people might still, you know, uh, round up or down depending on what's more socially desirable in this case. It's more socially desirable to be tall. Okay, uh, let's see. Closed ended nominal questions. You know, what is your current marital status? You choose one of multiple options. Uh, and partially closed ended, where you can, people can cross stuff off a list or add more uh, items to the list if none of those applies. Okay, so let's look at some uh, things that can go wrong. <coughs> so here, it's the same question phrased in three different ways. The first one is, how many times did you eat together as a family last week? And people can fill out the number of meals in that uh, answer box. Okay. Second one is, how many meals did you eat together as a family at home last week? What was the difference between the first and the second? Why is the second better? Why is that better? That's it, right? So like, would you count a snack as a meal? Would you, you know, not? Some people might, some people won't. But you know, a more accurate estimate would be to ask explicitly for the thing you actually care about, which is presumably meals in this case. The last one is, how many meals did you sit down to eat as a family uh, at home last week? So that's even more precise still, you know, did, did having uh, you know, a meal on the go as you were walking out, does that count? Or you know, so no, you just want the ones where you sit down you know, for dinner or something like that, presumably. Uh, okay. All right, so you can see how, uh, you know, here, there can be a lot of variation between um, what you get out depending on how specifically you phrase these questions. I don't know if I have, yeah, I don't have, I, have, I don't have the, the stats on that to kind of show you what you came out. Um, right, this is a list. You've seen a lot of these, I won't insist uh, on it now again. You've seen a lot of these in the interview uh, guide discussion. It's some of the same principles, you know, using specific words and you know, making sure yes means yes and no means no and complete sentences, etc. cetera. Uh, so a lot of that you've seen us uh, already. Right. Uh, so talking about open-ended questions, the ones where you just let people answer whatever, here's how much the specificity of wording can affect the data you get back. So uh, three 
versions of the same question, similar to the meals question a, a minute ago. When did you begin your studies at Washington State University? 13% of people reported the month and year only. Whereas in the last example, the most specific one, what month and year did you begin your studies at Washington State University? 84% of people actually filled out the data that they were looking for. Huge variation here and the quality of the data that they got back based on this very small, arguably uh, simple change between how they asked they ask the question and the two cases. Okay. So, you know, always ask specifically for things you, you actually care about. Uh, all right, this is about probing. So in your own words, how would you describe your advisors versus this question is very important to understanding the Washington State University student experience. Please take your time answering it as a preamble. And then in your own words, how would you describe your advisors? Huge difference in the uh, level of detail provided in the answers to the question and the second phrasing compared to the first. Lots more stuff. Uh, came out when they asked the question and a second version compared to the first. Uh, okay, more on probing. What businesses would you most like to see in the Pullman and Moscow area that are currently not available? That was the question. And then a random half of the students received the follow-up probe asking, are there any others? So the, I guess they had two text boxes. You know, they had a text box after the first question. Everybody got the same one. What businesses would you most like to see? And half of the people also got a second text box asking, are there any others? Again, huge difference. Ton, tons more information collected with the second uh, version of this compared to the first. I don't have the numbers right now. Oh, I do have the numbers right now. <laughs> well, okay. I stand corrected. Um, okay, and then also the type of probe you use will uh, have a huge impact. So again, in your own words, how would you describe your advisor or advisors and various probes that are possible here? Is there anything else? 18% so responded, most said no. Can you tell me more about that? 82% responded with additional information. Okay. The same for interviews, by the way, this carries over. Uh, we use probes a lot in interviews. Okay, uh, here's an example of uh, acquiescence in a question design. What was acquiescence again? What was acquiescence? Tendency for, people to agree. Tendency for people to agree. Thank you. I said, do you favor congressional term limits of four years, favor or oppose, versus how satisfied are you with the overall service you have received from your financial consultant? Sorry, not versus. These are both separate examples, uh, unrelated. How satisfied are you with the overall service you have received? Very satisfied to very dissatisfied. Why are these poor designs? other than because I said so, or because the slide said so. Where does acquiescence play in here? Yeah. Um, like first, it's like, you would probably pick favor if you're kind of in the middle, but also I feel like anytime you have an extreme answer, you have a not so extreme answer, everyone always picks the not so extreme answer. So it's like people are usually pick someone satisfied. So the, the trick is that's true also, but I think that answers a different question. The trick here is the way you have asked these questions was leading in both cases. In the first case, you asked, "Do you favor?" So there's you know there's the acquiescence comes up because people are more likely to agree with you, right? And you said favor, you didn't say oppose. Oh, so you'll get more favor options, more favor answers, just because people will be more likely to agree with you. Here, you've asked, how satisfied are you? 
there's no option to be dissatisfied in the question as formulated. You know, therefore, acquiescence will uh, lead to more people being satisfied than uh, than true. Does that make sense? So, how do we fix this? I mean, part of me, is, I, I don't know why, but this is just really reminding me of course evaluation because I think I've been hearing the how satisfied question on those like for years now. So I wonder if it depends on like, would there be cases where it would be like, I mean, to truly fix these, would you you make the question neutral, right? Like, are you, That's like, it. to what extent are you dissatisfied or satisfied? Yep. Um, but I wonder if there's incentives in some cases to like, want questions to be more positively leaning. I mean, as, I definitely when it comes to faculty course evaluations, the, the incentive on our side is to make the, you know, questions more positive leaning. Because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, if we say how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with this class, you know, the, the scores will drop. I mean, I'm not trying to be like accusatory or anything. <laughs> I'm just saying that, like, I feel like I still have seen the how satisfied are you like, all over the place in that just being one example. But I, I mean, I. Try to start the semester by saying, you know, doing all of this right is hard. Like it, it, most people do it wrong, right? In some aspect of it. Like, um, yeah. So of course you'll see, you know, counterexamples. But that's the trick. Now you can see them. Now you can spot them. You'll be like, yeah, that's bad. That's a bad design. You know, I can fix this. Okay, that's what I'm hoping you get out of this. When it comes to, you know, surveys and everything else. Right. So this was the way to fix this is to phrase it neutrally. Do you favor or oppose? How satisfied or dissatisfied are you? Uh, if I were to be super strict with this, I would probably also want to shuffle the order. Like sometimes I would want to start with how dissatisfied, and sometimes I would want to start with how satisfied, just because of uh, anchoring and priming. Right. So you know that would be, I think, you know, ideal. Like have send half the people satisfied first, half the people dissatisfied first. Okay. Uh, another one with primacy. Uh, so primacy was about you know anchoring and all that. We talked about this before. So here, which of the following resources have you used at Washington State University? Please check all that apply. Okay, so you're going down the list and checking them. The original order on the left hand side puts libraries at ninety five percent of respondents have used libraries, uh, and library instruction twenty percent. When you reverse the order of the answer options, library instruction 52% jumps up significantly from 20%. Uh, libraries stay uh, around 95, 93, a little bit less. A huge difference in the other one. Why? Because you know, as people were going down the list and checking stuff that applied to them, at some point they got bored. They were like, yeah, I've, I've crossed, I've checked enough of them, so I'm just gonna skip and not look at the other ones. Okay, that's what happens. Uh, so actually shuffling the order is the solution here as well so that you know at, at least uh, you know on average everybody gets them in the uh, in the same order uh, all right this is similar yeah so this, this is a similar uh, point to the one before where people have to go down the list and check things that apply to them at some point they will get bored and stop checking things because they feel like they've crossed them up and they you know, can move on to the next question. So a better design is to ask them individually with radio buttons about each one of these answer options to provide an answer individually to each of them. Like, do you have yes or no, this particular uh, type of device? Yes. I always feel nervous with those type of questions that people will just go like, I don't care, no, 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 no. <laughs> Because like, especially if it's like a like a matrix of like Likert scale questions where it's kind of a lot of clicking relatively. Yep. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on that? I do. Uh, anybody has any idea? And we'll end after this because we're on time. I don't want to keep it too long. Anybody has any ideas how to fix this? The you know random people just troll answering no to everything. Sophia. <laughs> Um, that would make it a little easier to answer if they're separate questions. Um, but it wouldn't preclude somebody from like not actually thinking about the question. 
<laughs> that, yes, <laughs> I think that's a good idea, but it makes it harder to answer. That's a trade off. Yep. Yeah, is it like having like the question like, are you paying attention or something? Like, yes. yes or no? Okay. <laughs> that is, is. That's it. That's it. That's probably the most common strategy is every few questions, like people that do studies on MTurk do this a lot, uh, the Amazon Mechanical Turk. Like every few hits or whatever, every few questions, you have a trick question in there. Uh, that's not part of your survey instrument, but it's only there to uh, gauge attention and allow you to filter out people that were not paying attention and discard those uh, responses. So, so you could literally have a question, you know, have you read this question? Right? Uh, and, you know, all the people that just say, you know, blanket no, you throw away afterwards. So that, that's one trick. Okay, so let me, let me end here. We have a little bit more on the Likert style questions. I guess I will do a little bit of that on Thursday.